Uh, good evening. I'm Reese Potterville, the, the president of the Graduate Theological Union, and I would like to welcome you this evening to the 40, 41st uh, Distinguished Faculty Lecture. This is a, a special event each year in which um, colleagues get to hear from one of their peers and of course students and staff and outsiders all come. But it's a special occasion because the faculty now get to um, hear and react to a scholar in their own midst, which they might not normally do during the course of a school year. To give you some idea of how privileged this is, if we had a faculty member giving a distinguished lecture each month, um, we could go for around nine years. So whoever arises to this occasion, um, based on the selection of their peers, is someone who is indeed um, highly regarded and revered, usually for their scholarship and also their citizenship in the wider community. So we welcome you. Um, I do want to mention that uh, there is a reception following in the Bidet Museum, which is directly across the way. And to warn you upon leaving that even though this is not a well-lit room, it's even darker outside. And there have been sad occasions when someone tripped or missed a step. So just be extra careful tonight. Um, and I noticed there's some water on the walkway as well. Um, so it makes it maybe especially hazardous. So we look forward to this evening and to introduce our speaker, I'm calling on Arthur Holder, former Dean of the Graduate Theological Union and a professor of Christian spirituality. The distinguished faculty lecturer uh, each year is chosen after nominations come in from the faculties of the member schools of the GTU and from the GTU rostered and in residence faculty. So there are nine nominees each year. And the rule is that you can't nominate someone from your own school. So uh, those nominations then come to the GTU Council of Deans, which d chooses um, on the basis of prayer and discernment. <laughs> There's no politicking allowed. Um, one person to speak to us who represents the ideals and vision of the GTU and that we know will be interesting. <laughs> we certainly have someone tonight as our lecturer who meets all of those criteria. Elizabeth Liebert is Professor of Spiritual Life and Director of the Program in Christian Spirituality at the San Francisco Theological Seminary, where she has taught since 1987. And she had a stint as Dean while uh, of the seminary and Vice President for Academic Affairs uh, several years ago. Her PhD is in Religion and Personality from Vanderbilt University. She's the author or editor of at least six books on, and many, many, many articles on topics that cluster around um, things like spiritual direction, discernment, the Ignatian spiritual exercises, the Psalms, and prayer. Her most recent book was published in 2015 entitled The Soul of Discernment a spiritual practice for communities and other institutions. Beth has made um, a real contribution in so many ways to the field of Christian spirituality. One of them that I'm very conscious of is pushing us beyond the focus on the individual to consider the community and even, yes, the institution as a site where God might be at work and uh, where discernment would be appropriate. She is a sister of the Holy Names and is very active in leadership in her community. She's also a past president of the Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality. 
I know from experience, as well as from the testimony of many students, that she is a wonderful mentor and uh, teacher, someone who treats each student with not only respect, but with um, a concern that they bring out their full potential, and uh, rather than trying to make other, make other students into a copy of herself, uh, really tries to help them to become the scholars that uh, they need to be. We're delighted to welcome her tonight, and following Beth's presentation, there will be two responses, the first by Robert John Russell, who is the E.N.G. Barber Professor of Theology and Science at the GTU, and the second by Catherine Baruch, who's the Thomas E. Bertelson Assistant Professor of Art History and Religion at the GTU and the Jesuit School of Theology. Uh, there will be time after that for questions and answers, and then, as we said, uh, a reception across the way. Please join me in welcoming Beth as she speaks to us tonight on the theme of academic life and scholarship as spiritual practice. It's lovely to hear all those things before you're dead. Thank you. So, thank you, Arthur. Colleagues, students, guests, good evening to you all. You're all most welcome to be here. And students, I especially greet and welcome you because you, in a very real sense, uh, remind us that we are all students. So thank you for being here. This is a little parenthesis. It wasn't in my original talk, but given the other night, I expect that some and perhaps most of you in this room are rather stunned still from the results of the election. Um, it might seem like our topic tonight is inconsequential in light of the implications that flow from that uh, decision. But I would like to propose that, I, that our topic really is very important in the light of that event. If our vocation is scholarship, doing that scholarship to the best of our ability in the service of God, our faith communities, and the world, I think is one of the best contributions we can make towards going forward together. So I invite you to listen in that spirit, and, and I hope that the comments give you some encouragement. Tonight I intend to break with the usual format of a 60 minute lecture with a single respondent and questions and comments from you all. Um, you may have picked up the first hint of this in that there was a piece of uh, scratch paper, uh, actually old SFTS letterhead, tucked inside of your program. Um, I will be asking you in a minute to reflect a little bit with that um, paper, and there's some pencils at the corner of the pews if you need uh, something to write with. But let me hasten to add that you, uh, your, what you write is for you alone, so the introverts among you can relax. It's not a test. In 1991, in an address to the Society for the Study of Christian Spirituality, I began with the following quotation from theologian Miroslav Volf. And this is the quotation. He says, right communal doing seems in some sense a precondition for right understanding. And he continues, the obverse is also true. Wrongdoing, especially if deeply patterned and long-lived leads to twisted understanding. Now on that occasion, the quotation provided a platform for my claim that practice, as I carefully defined it, is constitutive to the study of Christian spirituality. So here it is, 25 years later, after that address, and I, as a pastoral theologian who has specialized in Christian spirituality, am still engaged with the role of practice. Tonight, I would like to take the issue of practice in a somewhat different direction and explore the possibility that academic life 
and scholarship in particular is itself a spiritual practice. Now, this claim may be self-evident to a number in this room, because after all, the medieval university was originally staffed by religious persons who very likely assumed that their scholarship was spiritual practice. But for others, especially those of us living on this side of the Enlightenment, scholarship is simply, though profoundly, our professional calling. And we do not necessarily perceive it as having anything to do with our spiritual life, if indeed we even claim to have a spiritual life. Others may stumble with the term spiritual or spiritual life, wondering what they mean when I use them as part of my claim. Still others may wonder if the same claim can be made from outside of Christianity. Assuming that some in this audience will be in all of these positions, I will attempt what I hope is a plausible rationale for my claim, and then we will open the discussion by means of our invited conversation partners and your own reflections. So, here's where you get to write. So before I get underway with my argument, I'd invite you to reflect on your own experience as a scholar student. You can take whichever one of those you want or hold them both. Using that scratch paper for yourself, brainstorm and list as many different kinds of activities that you engage in or have engaged in that seem to you to be part of scholarship as you understand it. I'm only going to give you two minutes, so just right off the top of your head. As I said, this is for you, so you're not going to report it to anybody. Okay, you don't have to be done, but let me take you to the next task. Put a check mark by any of those activities that you listed that you believe are spiritual as you understand the term. Okay, finally, this is the hard part. Why did you pick those activities that you did as spiritual? See if you can write one sentence in which you answer that question for yourself. Why did you pick those activities? Like I said, this is not a test, so. But I, now we brought our experience into the room. That was my point here. Let's jump into the elements of my argument. I want to start with the word practice. Rebecca Chopp 
notice, notes that practice is a socially, this is a quote, socially shared form of behavior, a pattern of meaning and action that is both culturally constructed and individually instantiated. The notion of practice, of practice draws us to inquire into the shared activities of groups of persons that provide meaning and orientation to the world and that guide action. That's Rebecca Chop. Chop and others following Alastair McIntyre's treatment of practice in After Virtue understand practice to be bodily, social, interactive, cooperative, and to share rule-like regularities. They contain standards of excellence and thus necessitate self-critical reflection as part of a larger communal discourse. These scholars' understanding of praxis, practice focuses on large, larger scale communal practices over longer periods of time that address fundamental human needs and that together constitute a way of life. There are other scholars, often from the social sciences, who use the term practice to refer to any socially meaningful action. And in this understanding of practice can include smaller and more discrete actions. However, in terms of academic scholarship, the McIntyre sense of practice makes perfect sense. What scholars do is shared broadly over long periods of time, addresses human needs, and constitutes a way of life. Scholarship is broadly, is bodily, it's social, it's interactive and cooperative. We actually engage in actions such as research, writing, experimenting, drawing conclusions from data, and other methodologically consistent behaviors that others agree has a reasonable chance of advancing knowledge and or uncovering truth. And I would add constructing something elegant and beautiful. I get the elegance from science. May I assume that you can recognize your scholarship in this definition of practice and that we can agree that scholarship, among other ways that it might be described, is a practice. Something we do regularly and repeatedly at certain points publicly and in ways accountable to other scholars for the purposes of building a body of knowledge about a certain angle of inquiry that at least in the long run advances the good of humans and all creation. So now I want to move on to the word spiritual, which, as you know, is a notoriously contested word. It's used in so many different ways that it has to be defined in almost every context in which the word appears in order to keep the semantic confusion to a dull roar. The first thing we might notice is that it is the adjective form of the noun spirit. In common usage, the English word spirit, from the Latin spiritus, breath, usually refers to a non-corporeal substance, and it is contrasted with the material body. It's understood as a vital force that constitutes the living quality of material beings. It could also be used to refer to, the conscious, to consciousness or personality or to any incorporeal or immaterial being, such as demons or deities. Pick any, any dic dictionary and go for it. You'll find things that are like that. If we stay with these common sense understandings of spiritual, however, we can easily get lost in a dualism that pits body and spirit, material and immaterial. And that's a pitfall we would do well to avoid. So more about that in a moment. At this point, I have to claim my particular standpoint within Christianity. So I ask those of you who profess other religious standpoints to critique the adequacy of my logic from within your own tradition. Christian theology uses the term spirit, with a capital S, to describe a person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, which is to, to, to say, to describe both God's reality and God's manifestations in creation. The term spiritual, small s, appears early in Christian texts in 1 Corinthians 2, 11 to 16. 
There are other texts, of course, particularly in the fourth gospel that refer to spirit, but this Pauline text actually helps define spiritual as participating in the very life of the divine. So here's that text. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also, no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. See, there's your adjective. That is, according to Paul, only humans can know the human spirit, and likewise only God, here the spirit of God, can know God's spirit. But God's spirit has been given to us, so we can ourselves at least begin to interpret and participate in God's reality and activity. Now Paul understands that spirit is uh, in interior, is an interior reality, he says, the human spirit that is within. For Paul, spirit is that gift given to the human person that enables them to partake of the divine. It is more pervasive and deeper than other interior realities. It points us to the very source of meaning in the universe because it points us to the creator of all that is. But is it merely or even primarily immaterial? According to Paul, spirit is that aspect of the human that participates in the life of God. And, like God's spirit, is therefore likewise concerned with the fullness and flourishing of all creation. So the spiritual life joins us to God's creation, God's creative activity toward that flourishing. And we are hopefully, finally, coming to the, recogni the recognition that flourishing is very much material, bodily, fleshly, earthly, as well as immaterial. So I want to avoid that dualism that we can, could and did for a long time fall into. The key that connects this passage to our concern comes a couple of verses later in that same Pauline passage. It's the simple and profound statement, but we have the mind of Christ. The Christian theological claim in general outlines goes like this. If Christ is the incarnated word of God, that is, God taken flesh in, that, in a real human person, Jesus of Nazareth, and if that human person is indeed the Christ, the anointed one, the Savior, returning all things to God, then we too participate with Christ in God's own life. But we have the mind of Christ, says Paul, we have been given the enormous gift of participating in the very life of God. The spiritual then is that which is open to the action of the spirit, capital S, that comes to us as gift. But to have access to it, one must dispose oneself by means of practice, practices. And here the Greek word is askesis, from which we get the word exercise and carries the sense of bringing mastery through repetition. So you see where I'm going. It will help us in developing our larger argument on scholarship as spiritual practice to take a bit of digression into the academic discipline of Christian spirituality, as this discipline has struggled over the years with various understandings of the word spirituality. To understand this term, I will offer a definition of our GTU colleague, Sandra Schneiders, who's sitting somewhere in the room. Um, for, she says, spirituality is the experience of conscious involvement in the project of life integration through self-transcendence toward the ultimate value one perceives. In this definition, Snyders is being particularly careful to, to define spirituality as a broad, in a broad human-based way so that, hopefully, all or most persons from a variety of religious tradition or no tradition can identify with the word. 
Of course, one can go on to locate spirituality within a particular religious tradition, and Sandra is on record in many places doing so. Schneider's is not alone in this orientation. Walter Principe points us to the same direction. He says, a person's chosen ideal and the striving to live toward that ideal is spirituality at the existential level. Note that the chosen ideal need not necessarily be framed religiously. So, when we examine Schneider's anthropologically based definition, we see three active elements that comprise it. It's there's conscious involvement, there's a project of life integration through self-transcendence, and there's, it's directed toward the ultimate value that one perceives. So, following Sandra, we can note that spirituality is neither purely spontaneous nor something that is done to us without our participation by some other agent, nor simply a collection of episodic experiences one after the other. Instead, spirituality includes intentionality. Conscious choice is integral to this definition. We choose to engage in certain activities, either because of their intrinsic value or because of where these actions lead. These actions are determined in light of their end. And their final goal is something that is highly valuable and indeed sets the primary orientation and direction of one's life. Furthermore, this end is not purely self-referential. I wrote this before the election. It's not purely self-referential. It's not about one's purely private satisfaction, but it pulls us out of our limited horizons and propels us beyond ourselves to attain this ultimate value. Theistic persons typically understand that ultimate horizon to be God or ultimate mystery, but it can also be other penultimates, such as the full development of human personhood, enlightenment, the good of the cosmos, the transcendentals of beauty, unity, truth, goodness, and so on. Of course, it's easy to see that one could put a less than altruistic goal at the center of one's life. Pleasure, sex, money, power all too frequently become enshrined in the position of ultimate value that one perceives. But here Sandra insists that an adequate understanding of spirituality excludes such negative life orientations as addictions and exploitative projects that seek one's own good <clears throat> at the expense of others. The ultimate value must function as a horizon leading the person toward truth. I want to underline that there is an inescapably moral dimension to this understanding of spirituality. True spirituality does not use power to dominate and destroy, rather it enhances individuals and communities. It breaks down power differentials and it sets individuals and communities free to live deeper and fuller lives. Now, Sandra further claims that spirituality in this broad sense is characteristic of humans prior to any religious or theological reflection. Spirituality, she says, this is a phrase that's hers, is an anthropological constant, by which she means it is constitutive of the human person. Thus, persons of multiple religious and theological perspectives, or none at all, can share this definition, or at least I believe that is her aim. Approaching spirituality this way also allows for multifaceted exploration through as many avenues of human inquiry as are appropriate to the particular problem, question, or reality under consideration. And those of you who've participated in, in the academic discipline of spirituality as we've done it at the GTU know that's why we have created such an interdisciplinary program. Looking around at our um, multi and non-religious cultures, it's very clear in contemporary usage, terms spiritual and spirituality have long since escaped the parameters imposed by any theological categories, for better or worse. We can then, I believe, construct, uh, connect Sandra's definition back to Paul's use of the term spiritual. We have already noted that Paul sees spiritual as pointing directly to the Holy Spirit, to God's own self, 
and that the adjective spiritual designates the quality of living in the light of that divine spirit. This spirit searches everything, our own spirits included. Since, Paul claims, we have been given this spirit with this knowledge that Paul calls wisdom, we can order our lives in light of God's spirit, searching everything. So my claim here, we can express this reality that is uh, in a framework broader than the Christian distinctives that I used to construct it. That is, we can order our lives around searching out manifestations of the true, the good, and the beautiful to such a degree, degree that these become our ultimate goal. So, if you're still with me this far, the last two steps are easy. First, a spiritual practice then becomes the regular, repeated, intentional, embodied actions that lead step by step towards enhanced good, true, and beautiful, shared with and evaluated within a community of shared practice according to agreed upon standards of excellence. And second, scholarship in this understanding can become a primary vocation and its practice indeed a spiritual practice. Now that's the hard work. Now we get to have some fun. Now that we've constructed a common understanding of spiritual practice and scholarship as spiritual practice, let me invite you into a spiritual practice that I believe can be embraced by scholars of many disciplines and many religious traditions. If you listen below the particularly Christian language, which, which I will try following Sandra's example to broaden towards anthropological constants, I hope that you will recognize what you pursue in your scholarship. So the particular practice that I want to pose tonight is Lexio Divina, or divine reading. It appears early in the Western monastic tradition and even earlier in Origen, Ambrose, and Augustine. That means, incidentally, that Lexio Divina is already abroad in the land during the rise of the Western University starting around the 11th century. The in the Benedictine context, Lexio Divina was the consistent reading and rumination, usually on the scriptures, that permeated the entire day. In the 12th century work entitled The Ladder of Monks, Guigo II formalized these steps into the method that's often taught today as Lexio Divina. And the, the steps you probably recognize, Lexio or reading, meditatio or ruminating, oratio or praying, and contemplatio, or resting and contemplating. Although I will, for convenience sake, walk through the steps in the order pro provided by Guigo, I do so with the caveat that the order is not at all sacred. Practice day after day, hour after hour, in and around other more mundane activities, the steps of Lexio take on a life of their own, changing order, weaving in and out, circling back to a step just completed, or jumping ahead to the next most important step in a dynamic that has its own life. Adapted to our more anthropological stance and language, and for purposes of scholarly inquiry as a spiritual practice, let me explicate these familiar steps this way. So first, I want to start with something that's not quite in the formal lexio that I just listed. I want to start with intention. This is a strategy for beginning a spiritual exercise that I get from Ignatius of Loyola. In every one of his spiritual exercises, he tells the one making the exercise, ask for what you desire. Asking at the head of the activity is a way to invite yourself to consciously enter the practice, to dedicate it to the service of the divine or of truth, and to begin to focus your attention. It's a very practical way to show up more fully. A basic intention that may work for you as a scholar, follow the good, the true, or beautiful wherever they take you and share this journey with others. The first of Guigo's steps is Lexio, or reading. In its origin, Lexio was text-based, either a written text spoken aloud, or a text heard and subsequently memorized and recited. The goal of this repeated reading and hearing and speaking was to anchor the text deep inside. Our more anthropological orientation might extend 
to loving attention upon whatever is the subject of study. You look deeply at the phenomenon or the data, noticing its particularity, the disparities it contains, the divergence from other examples, its uniqueness. You may find it surprises you. You may notice its difference from you. You turn it around and around in your mind and your imagination and your intuition, being exquisitely curious about it in all its particularity. Now, a little aside, those of you who are familiar with Guigo's practice may notice that I am claiming something for Lexio that actually bleeds into meditatio. But uh, bear with me, because I want to push meditatio uh, to a slightly different place. Another voice familiar to many will help here. It's Simone Weil. In Reflections on the Right Use of School Studies with a View to Love of God, Vey's central point has to do with developing the capacity for attention. For her, prayer consists in the orientation of all the attention of which the soul is capable toward God. She advocates attention in everything related to study, even such boring activities as grammar and algebra proofs. And she's writing about students a little younger than we. So she would certainly include the kinds of activities we listed as activities of, of our scholarship. Attention in everything is part of developing this absolute attention for God. This is Faye again. Without our knowledge or feeling it, this apparently barren effort has brought forth more light into the soul. The result will one day be discovered in prayer. That's the end of that quote. Clearly, attention is a spiritual practice in her mind. Helpfully, in the very next paragraph, she widens her perspective to include non-believers. She says, quite apart from explicit religious belief, every time that a human being succeeds in making an effort of attention with the sole idea of increasing his grasp of truth, he acquires a greater aptitude for grasping it, even if his effort produces no visible fruit. So if that is what attention does, what does they mean by attention? This is a quote. Attention consists of suspending our thoughts, leaving it detached, empty, and ready to be penetrated by the object. It means holding it in our minds, within reach of this thought, but on a lower level and not in contact with it. The diverse knowledge we have acquired, which we are forced to make use of. Our thoughts should be in relation to all particular and already formulated thoughts. Above all, our thoughts should be empty, waiting, not seeking anything, but ready to receive in its naked truth the object which is to penetrate it. That they makes another claim. She says, attention is difficult, more difficult than simply working long hours. She believes that there is something in us that is repugnant to the laser-like attention she is proposing, and it requires vigilance. Clearly, this kind of attention at this cost is, for Hervé, a spiritual discipline for students and scholars. Close to 30 years ago, Jesuit Walter Burkhart defined contemplation to be a long, loving look at the real. My students know I say this frequently. I think Burkhart and Ve are talking about the same activity, the same quality of attentive openness to what is there, as it is, unclouded by our own assumptions as we can allow it to be given our situated humanness. They suggest a more imageless path and Burkhardt a path that can be full of images, the traditional apophatic and cataphatic distinction. But I don't think we have to rank them or choose between them. The choice may come precisely from the object of our attention or it may come from the way our practice begins to open up with much repetition. In either case, says they, the object of our attention may reveal its bit of truth to us. 
as a gift. Moving on to meditatio or rumination. In the classic spiritual practice, meditatio was the continual rumination on the, whatever the text opened up. In the context of academic scholarship, the parallel, I propose, includes such activities as framing a line of investigation, formulating a research question, then deciding, given the question, an appropriate method that balances one's own subjectivity with rigorous attention to what is really there. Then comes the long process of engaging that reality at depth over time and noticing what happens between you, the observer, and the observed. Both of you are changed. As church historian and spirituality scholar Belden Lane says, I won't love what I haven't first learned to know in exquisite detail. But he also approvingly quotes George Washington Carver, to wit, if you love it enough, anything will talk to you. Lane continues to develop the dynamic interaction between knowing and between knowledge and love as he acknowledges that love itself becomes a way of knowing. The effort to know always more deeply is part of the spiritual practice. We engage in learning to know long before, but in the hope that the knowledge may someday blossom into love, which in turn opens up into a whole new level of knowledge. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Oratio, or prayer. The classic spiritual practice of oratio includes addressing God directly in light of one's own lexio and meditatio. Scholarly practice entails, I propose, engaging in dialogue about the reality one has been attending to and exploring it through appropriate scholarly disciplines. It could be talking to oneself. I do this all the time when I'm trying to work something out and it hasn't quite connected. It could be talking back to one's subject or it could be writing about it. Such solitary activities, most of us know, are a big part of scholarship. But it could also be talking to others about one's subject, teaching about it. How many of us test out our ideas in the classroom? Speaking in public about the subject, here the scholar controls the exposition in large part, but there's still another level. Deep collegial sharing where each party engages as both initiator and receiver, listening together to how others see the same reality. Notice that the understanding and relationship to the subject develops differently in a community of inquiry than it does if one simply pursues the inquiry as a solitary being or maintains the control and the initiative in how it's exposed. Quantum theorist David Bohm claims that even science, which is often understood to be the bastion of experiment and the antithesis of conversation, is based on deep conversation. He's not talking about discussion where ideas are batted back and forth and a subject of common interest is analyzed and dissected, with each participant attempting to forge a strong position that ultimately prevails over the perspective of others. He has in mind what he calls dialogue. It occurs when a group becomes open to the flow of a larger intelligence. That's his phrase. In this kind of dialogue, participants do not seek to win, only to participate together in a larger pool of meaning that is always developing, a larger pool of common meaning that cannot be accessed individually. In this kind of dialogue, the whole organizes the parts, and it can form individuals into a powerful learning community. Scholarly oratio, perhaps? And finally, contemplatio. In the classic exercise, contemplation consisted simply of resting, present to all that is, and in particular to the divine hovering within and around. Is there an analogy in our scholarship? I think we have come full circle, back to Belden Lane's dynamic of knowing, loving, being present, 
and to Simone Weil's understanding of absolute attention being prayer, and Walter Burkhardt's description of contemplation as a patient, leisurely, unhurried, loving look at the real, allowing ourselves to be open to it, to be captured by it, to accept it on its own terms, to love it, and to respond to it in such a way that the world becomes better. In my experience of trying to put into words this aspect of scholarship, I find I have to give up my prose and turn to the poets. My next turn, but beyond this evening's time frame, will be the poet Rainer Rilke's In Seeing. To tantalize us a bit, as I am not prepared yet to, with words around this aspect of scholarship as spiritual practice. Rilke describes in seeing with the very earthly metaphor of a dog. So he says, I love in seeing. Can you imagine with me how glorious it is to in see? For example, a dog as one passes by. In see. And in parentheses, he says, I don't mean inspect which is only a kind of human gymnastic by means of which one immediately comes out again on the other side of the dog, regarding it merely, so to speak, as a window upon humanity lying behind it. Not that. But to let oneself precisely into the dog's very center, the point from which it becomes a dog, the place where God, as it were, would have sat down for a moment when the dog was finished in order to watch it under the influence of its first embarrassments and inspirations, and to know that it was good, that nothing was lacking, that it could not have been better made. Parker Palmer offers us a way to bring all this rambling about scholarship as spiritual practice together in an early essay describing a spirituality of education. He observes, to know in truth is to become betrothed, to engage the known with one's whole self, an engagement one enters with attentiveness, care, and goodwill. To know in truth is to allow oneself to be known as well, to be vulnerable to the challenges and changes any true relationship brings. To know in truth is to enter into the life of that which we know and to allow it to enter into ours. Truthful knowing weds the knower and the known. Even in separation, the two become part of each other's life and fate. In truthful knowing, the knower becomes co-participant in a com community of faithful relationships with other persons and creatures and things with whatever our knowledge makes known. So finally, how is scholarship a spiritual practice? The careful work of the scholar can be transformative precisely in the way it brings us face to face with the radical otherness of what it is we study. And in the very wrestling with this otherness, we might be transformed. That is, not only might our scholarly opinions and conclusions be revised, but the very way we act and live might also change, and the world itself. I'd like the last words out of my mouth to be those of a philosopher and a poet, the philosopher we've already met, Simone Weil, and she closes the right use of school studies with these words. Academic work is one of those fields which contain a pearl so precious that it is worthwhile to sell all our possessions, keeping nothing for ourselves in order to acquire it. And here is what the poet Mary Oliver might, how she might describe this dynamic reality in her own inimitable spare way. This poem is entitled, Praying. It doesn't have to be the blue iris. 
It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention. Then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest, but the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. That was so moving. Beth graciously invited me to offer a brief response <clears throat> on how I see scientific methodologies um, being or having the potential to be a, a spiritual practice. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. I'm honored and delighted to do so by turning to one of the three major CTNS programs of the past decades and then to my own experience of the practice of natural science at UC Santa Cruz. <clears throat> the CTNS program Science and the Spiritual Quest was a multi-million dollar program funded by the John Templeton Foundation extending from 1996 to 2003. In it, CTNS sought out scientists of international reputation in such areas as physics, cosmology, evolutionary and molecular biology, the neurosciences, computer science, and mathematics who were also practitioners of one of the world's leading religions, including Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. We asked each of them one central question. In your experience as an accomplished scientist and a participant in a global spirituality, how is the doing of science a spiritual quest, and a spiritual experience? The response from the scientists were profound. They included the following. <clears throat> The doing of science is a spiritual experience. The doing of science requires an ethical commitment grounded in spirituality. Nature is a form of divine revelation. We're reading the book of nature, God's second book, and it complements scripture. Science gives us knowledge about God's purposes in creating the universe and humanity's place, purpose, and destiny. Science discloses the mind of God through the laws of nature. Science tells us the story of the cosmos as the history of God's activity in the world. Science leads us to find God, the ultimate reality and source of the universe, and this God is present and imminent throughout the universe. All this is well summarized by Jewish cosmologist Joel Primack, who wrote, <clears throat> quote, the doing of science is a spiritual experience. Nothing compares with the wonder and exhilaration you feel when hard work yields a secret about the universe that perhaps, perhaps only you have discovered. The discoveries of SSQ harmonizes wonderfully with what Beth just told us tonight about her central claim, namely that academic life and scholarship in general, in particular, is itself a spiritual practice. Beth augmented this claim in several ways. First, drawing on Rebecca Chop. Beth notes that practice is a socially shared form of behavior, a pattern of meaning and action that is both culturally con constructed and individually instantiated. How perfectly this describes the spiritual practice of science. As a community project of international and intercultural dimensions with no barriers. <clears throat> it's shared history and normative paradigms all infusing the lives of individuals, as Dave Bohm said, brought into conversation and dialogue, individuals who through rigorous methodologies seek to discover for themselves and to proclaim to the world scientists' truths about nature for the sheer sake of such participatory knowledge. 
Next, Beth threw on the writings of our dear G2 colleague, Sandra, uh, and, ment and mentor, Sandra Schneiders, who gave an anthropological definition of spirituality as involving, quote, conscious involvement, the project of life integration through self-transcendence and one pointed toward the ultimate value one perceives, unquote. To me, this fits perfectly with science as a spiritual practice, requiring one's total conscious involvement in its theories and experiments. The demand to integrate personally all one learns about nature by committing to the path of self-transcendence and the giving up of oneself wholly to the rigors of scientific research and life. And finally, reaching the ultimate value offered by science to its practitioners, namely, discovering the all-encompassing reality of nature, its staggering intelligibility, its endless, pristine, and exquisitely beautiful context, the context of all that is, our material existence, a universe whose very matter, at last, is seen as truly mattering. Finally, Beth turned to the distinguished philosopher Simon Weil, who points to attention as that which, quote, consists of suspending our thought, leaving it detached, empty, and ready to be penetrated by its object, ready to receive in its naked truth the object which it is to, is to penetrate it. What an apt description of the attention that is called for, in fact, demanded for in both theoretical and experimental science. I remember well staring at an equation with only four Greek letters, delta, delta, and an equals zero. Delta, delta equals zero. On the blackboard at UC Santa Cruz where I did my PhD. It's an equation which encapsulates in those four symbols all of the details of the 256 coupled four-dimensional equations at the core of Einstein's general theory of relativity. There I learned to dwell in and with these four letters and through complex, math, complex and demanding mathematical reasoning to unpack their secret contents and to discover a hidden description of the entire physical universe contained within them. I also remember lowering the temperature of liquid helium in my lab towards absolute zero Kelvin and watching as cooling it went superfluid. Suddenly there was total quiescence, bubbles gone, liquid silence. In both cases, I was engulfed by attention to the phenomena in nature of nature, of which I'm a phenomena. Phenomena which lie way beyond our ordinary human experience and hit at, hint at nature in her secret modes of being, into the pure mathematics that embraces all that we know empirically about the universe. There were true, these were truly spiritual moments for me, moments in my long spiritual quest for reality, truth, goodness, and beauty, the transcendentals, expressed in the hidden folds of nature by the contemplation of its most serene mathematical regularities. These were rare moments, passionately sought out and immensely prized by me, moments of Lectio Divina, where the sacred text is the mathematics we write down on paper, and the universe endlessly lying, endlessly lying beyond it, which this mathematics alone reveals. A universe in which we truly live and move and have our being. A, new, a universe which science discovers through its direct, personal, and corporate experience as a, science, as a spiritual practice. In all this, I'm grateful to Beth for fleshing out the deep and moving connections between academic life and spiritual practice, and I welcome many more such conversations with her in the years to come. Thank you. I would also like to thank um, Beth for inviting me to reflect on this topic, and I'm just going to offer another case study, this time from the arts. After completing my undergraduate work, I had the unique opportunity to embark on a year-long Vonderjahr, funded by the Thomas J. Watson Foundation to explore an inkling of an idea that had started to form. 
I had been simultaneously studying Tibetan Buddhism and Christian medieval manuscripts. And I was fascinated with the idea that art making itself could be construed as a sacred journey <clears throat> within the religious art of both traditions. I set off one day in April, my backpack bursting at the seam like Samwise Gamgee's from Lord of the Rings. But instead of crockery and spices, I had pigment and brushes. I would go on to work with illuminators and iconographers in their scriptoria and Tonka painters at the Norba Linka Institute at the Dalai Lama's ex exile community in Dharamsala. During that trip, I had the pleasure to work closely with an iconographer named Aidan Hart, who is a member of the Orthodox Church in Britain. He believes that he is called to perceive the essence or the logos of his subjects in holy persons as well as events and sacred landscapes and then manifest this in paint. He does not copy his subjects, but rather relies on the inspiration of the spirit to unearth these qualities, what Gerard Manley Hopkins called the instress of a thing, and what Professor Liebert invokes so eloquently in her lecture this evening. In his own words, he underscores the traditional role of these sacred objects. Icons are not only manifestations of heaven to earth, but are an offering of man to God, a priestly prayer in paint rather than word. The kind of experience of viewing that religious and liturgical art aims to unite the heavenly and earthly realms is an imperfect mirror of a sort of heavenly archetype. In this way, the art itself is able to participate in what it represents. To explain further, in many ways, all religious art is the embodiment of a sacred journey for both the maker and the viewer. The process of visually narrating encounters with sacred space through visual and verbal emblems is a multi-dimensional process where art making and viewing both form reenacted pilgrimages in and of themselves. Anagogic Im imagery like this is well rooted in Christian mysticism. For example, the 12th century philosopher and theologian Hugh of St. Victor presented an image as a vehicle towards finding God within. With its Old Testament iconography and layers of meaning, Hugh employs the image of Noah's Ark, which becomes a sort of form of visual exegesis. The Ark visually articulates the interior life in the form of ladders advancing through various stages of contemplative life and vision, as well as actually becoming the mystical body of Christ, with limbs and head extending beyond the boat itself. This was meant to assure the viewer of God's presence within. In the 19th century, the poet, artist, and visionary William Blake spoke of entering into his images of wonder and expressed the hope that they would help the viewer gain a closer proximity to the divine, as well as to break off the mind-forged manacles of societal oppression. I'm going to dwell on Blake because it was a 19th century context that I would ultimately focus on for my first book, and the example provides a good example of how being rooted in practice has positively impacted my own scholarly research pursuits. So the following is presented as a very brief case study of Professor Liebert's theory of scholarship as spiritual practice that was presented this evening. To clarify, what I mean is that studying and occasionally painting alongside artists, working within specific religious and liturgical traditions during my Watson Fellowship year, allowed me to take seriously the idea of painting as a meditative process. By the time I landed in the 19th century, I noticed that Blake's ideas resonated with the art of the traditional icon painter. He said, for example, quote, prayer is the study of art, praise is the practice of art, fasting, etc., all relate to art. And this actually has echoes with um, the idea of entering into practice of the Lexio Divina. Blake's discursive self-awareness and synthesis of aesthetics with mysticism allowed me to position him as both a pilgrim and a painter and situate him within a trajectory of earlier religious artists and illuminators. At a time when anti-Catholic rhetoric was still rampant, Blake would give a Spanish Roman Catholic saint associated with mental pilgrimage, that is Teresa of Avila, a privileged place in his own mythopoetic system. Blake's student, fellow artist Samuel Palmer, related that, quote, Blake was fond of the works of St. Teresa, and often quoted them with other writers on the interior life, and that St. Teresa was his delight. He gave her pride of place at the, quote, wine press of love, which serves as a gateway to Beulah 
in his illuminated work, Jerusalem. He also started to insert a small nun-like figure into places where his visual and written texts would resonate with Teresa's writings. Of particular interest were themes regarding spiritual and corporeal vision or locution, the soul's pilgrimage through four transformative states, and our ultimate experience of transverberation or mystical union with the divine as represented by Bernini in the famous sculpture. Using a number of other case studies, I then started to tease out themes of Catholic influence that ran through the art and also theology of this tricky pre-emancipation period when Roman Catholics were struggling to regain civil liberties in the UK, including the right to worship. The overarching theme of art making as, as pilgrimage, which I started with a long time ago, provided a new interpretive angle for my project. It also contributed to studies of the cultural and religious history of Britain by tracing a common enterprise and conceptual framework, that of spiritual journey, across a variety of systems of religious belief. By doing so, it also allowed me to present a, histori a historiographic critique of both secularist and denominational assumptions in literary criticism, cultural anthropology, and the art historical studies of what we know as the quote-unquote romantic period. This project was a tiny drop in the bucket, but I hope that the trajectory of my research illustrates in some small way the flourishing that can take place when, as Professor Liebert has described, scholarship meets spiritual practice. Temporal boundaries have been broken down in my scholarly practice, allowing me to sort of start to confront the radical otherness of the past that was discussed this evening. And <clears throat> although the case study I focus on here is historic, my more recent research has taken a sociological turn as I study aspects of pilgrimage practice today. Um, and I've had the opportunity to walk, pray, and break bread with people in marginalized communities who feel the same sense of alienation that Blake felt in his own time. So given the um, political climate of the country at the present, um, I would like to invite Professor Liebert to um, also discuss how we can keep on keeping on, to paraphrase Bob Dylan. That is to say, how can we um, affect change through continuing our work and indeed our vocation of creating scholarship as spiritual practice? Thank you, Beth, for the opportunity. Thank you, Beth and Bob and Kate. Um, if you're like me, you're thinking, all of that went by so fast, I'd like to be able to uh, hear that again. And the good news is we can, because uh, thanks to Kyle Schiffelbein, who's our course design specialist here at the GTU, and the uh, good auspices of PLTS, uh, the Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary, uh, in their technology, this is all being live streamed and will be available soon? Uh, a recording of the live stream will be available right after the event. A recording of the live stream will be available as soon as you can get home after the reception. And uh, you can get there by going to the GTU website and looking for Distinguished Faculty Lecture. Would that be a good way to do it? The same link for the live stream. Good. Uh, so, we have a few minutes for questions, and uh, Beth, if you'd like to just come up and field those, you may want to start with responding to Kate's question. And I'm going to have the roving, uh, roaming mic, and so if you have a question or a comment, please keep it brief, uh, and just raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you. Well, that's a big question that Kate asked, but it's, I think it's a fair question given the climate. Um, the first thing that popped into my mind was what happened to me um, the night after the election. Um, I uh, probably, like a number of you, uh, the night of the election, I was up like late, late, late. And, you know, and the next day, along with many, 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 many other people, I was, uh, you know, my head down in my shoes and, you know, just sort of struggling to make sense out of things. And um, worked hard all day at my work, my scholarship. And the last thing I was going to do in the evening was to respond to a scholar in uh, Great Britain who sent me two chapters of a book she's working on and she wanted, she's using some of my work in it, and she wanted, please would I look and see if I had been fair to, to she had been fair to my work. 
and she had a deadline, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll at least start this. But of course, the night before caught up with me and I fell asleep. And at 3.30 in the morning, I woke up and there was the election. Again, I was gonna say something about the election, but you can fill it in. There was the election and I thought, oh shoot, I'm not going back to sleep. I am going to worry about all these implications. So what I did was I picked up the work I was working on and started back in her text, looking at it and working on it. And within 20 minutes, I had settled my inside and realized that she was working on listening in such a way that she was telling me exactly what I needed to do about the culture. And I went back to sleep. <laughs> And then I realized that what she was inviting me to do was to enter into this common dialogue, even though she was on one side of the Atlantic and I was on the opposite end of the US, thanks to email. And uh, she was building this common thing that was bigger than either of us. That was the first thing that came to me when you said, would, would I do this? But the second thing that I started to think about was just take Physician, heal yourself. Just take the Lexio and think about it and let it do its work in this context. And it will ask you for attentiveness, it'll ask you for intention. And I'm going to suggest that um, the intention for me, maybe, would be for you is how can I live? And, and work with the results of this election with integrity and uh, with a minimum of anger, uh, unproductive anger, profit, I mean, just stirring around inside of me anger, um, so, that, so that I can turn my energy to something that's constructive. So that became my intention. And then oh, I have to, pay, we have to pay attention. What did this mean? Where did it come from? We have to study it. We have to talk about it. We have to think collectively about what to do. And then we have to rest in a moment that helps us understand what's the next step that we should take. So I, the, the same Lexio can give us a way forward, I think. So that's my answer. So other questions, comments, responses, arguments? Yes. You said spirituality is constitutive of the human person. I'm reminded of what Yahweh said in the Old Testament. I will write my law into your hearts, not merely given to Moses in the two tablets. In other words, if it is constitutive of the human person, that much spirituality should be there in every person. But however, this world, modern world of the 21st century is divided. And a lot of divisions based on culture, ideology, religion. Even scholarly works has divided. And the scholarly work divided the churches and the Catholic Church itself, different traditions have come. Some scholarly works have been put in the index, no longer accessible. It might be spirituality to the individual, but the individual has gone through a lot of suffering. It has not benefited at all. How can I use this spirituality in scholarly work to promote sort of a dialogue in the world, dialogue of religions, dialogue of culture, like in the world must come together. When theologians come together, they argue, discuss, take a position. When mystics, can you promote mystical spirituality or eco-spirituality? Big question. Yes, works can be used to divide. Yes, we argue. But why do we argue? We can argue to tear the other down, to upstage the other, or we can argue together to get closer to truth, to get closer to beauty, to get closer to goodness. So go back to, I think, go back to the intention, go back to why it is we do what we do, and believe me, the intention's hard to stay with. It's not necessarily easy. But to go back to that and be trying to live out of it and contributing our own best insight to the larger discussion. 
I don't think there's anything else we can do, but I think we can do that. Another question or comment? Thank you for a beautiful lecture and wonderful responses. I wanted to pick up on Orazio a little bit. I really appreciated your expansion of the term beyond prayer to communication and, and dialogue. Um, I'm curious, and, and I understand you do that for the anthropological, sort of the broader anthropological purpose, but I'm curious if you could speak a little bit about how you see dialogue particularly with the divine or prayer with God as a part of spirit uh, of scholarship? Well, that feels to me, uh, how do I say this? This feels to me to be self-evident enough that it, uh, that I, I'm actually going to have a hard time put, to put words on it, but as a religious person, as a member of a religious community, as a hopefully a spiritual person, a person who practices spirituality, I do pray. I pray all the time. I pray every day. Um, hopefully several, many times during the day. I, I pray about what I'm doing all the time. If you read my journals, you'd think they were totally boring because I'm literally writing about what it is I do. And in the writing, I am saying, to God be here as I do it. This is how I do my scholarship. I am proposing that maybe that works for you, but I don't think it has to. Um, everyone has to figure out how they do that for him or her, yourself. Um, because there are many ways to do this as there are people, as there are relationships with God. So there isn't a right way to do it. I just told you the way I do it. Um. I think we might be finished. Yeah. I thank you all for being such a lovely audience. I'm just going to tell people to go to the reception. And then we'll... So we were able to uh, continue the conversation. Now, uh, across the way in the Bade, uh, there is a lot of food and drink. And so please help us to um, uh, be good stewards of that and to uh, <laughs> use it for its intended purpose. Uh, as Reese reminded us, be careful going down the steps and, uh, the, the light, and help one another. This is an opportunity to uh, exercise companionship and guidance on pilgrimage as you go across there. Uh, thank you for uh, all of you who have made this possible. Uh, I want to especially thank uh, Angela Munoz in the Dean's office for her organizational wizardry once again in uh, putting all this together and uh, hope that uh, you've enjoyed this uh, and as on all of those who have been watching us on live stream and that you'll want to watch it again when you get home. So thank you. Have a good evening. Uh, see you next year. Right. Yeah. <laughs>